thank you for inviting me to give this lecture about my my journey to Catholicism. And I want to offer a short introduction and then tell you how I'm going to lay out the material. That, of course, is one of the biggest challenges, how to describe the journey, what things matter more than others. Non angli sit angeli, said Pope Gregory, when he found some Anglo-Saxon slaves in the marketplace at Rome. He saw these fair-haired, rather beautiful boys, and he asked where they'd come from, that they should arrive at the slave market. And he was told that, that, um, that they were Angles. And he said, no, they're not, not, they're not Angles, they're angels, and uh, insisted they should be bought and, and rescued and brought to the Catholic Church. Not angles, but angels seems to me to describe the journey that I've taken. My my life as an Anglican was part of the Anglican Church, a state church. And the journey has been an angelic one, a one from a state religion to, um, I think, what I would want to call a supernatural religion. And it's this movement from the political or the national to the supernatural that I think acts as a as a very good narrative or understanding key for myself to understand the journey. I want to do this in four parts. I want to look first of all at the, the crisis that the culture wars opposes for the church, and the second section, the fragility of Protestantism, and then to look at what happens when you start reading the fathers, and finally to look at the significance of the supernatural. But first, I think um, two of my, my mentors, my people who've had a, a very big effect on me, one is G.K. Chesterton, and he said that um, there are uh, thousands of reasons for uh, explaining why I'm a Catholic, but they're all variations on, on the one simple fact that I discovered Catholicism was true. Um, that seems to me to sum up beautifully what I'm about to describe. Arranging the material, though, is more, is more problematic because we, we're struck with um, intellectual analysis and spiritual discernment. And I thought C.S. Lewis summed it up beautifully with this quote from the Screwtape Letters. He said, Humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. As spirits they belong to the eternal world, but as animals they inhabit time. This means while their spirit can be directed as to an eternal object, their bodies, their passions, their imaginations are in continual change, for to be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation, the repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back, a series of troughs and peaks. So here we have the notion of change, which of course reminds us of St John Henry Newman uh, and his uh, exposition of the way in which doctrine changed within the Catholic Church and developed as a response to the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus made. But we have, too, the reminder that we are both angles and angels. We belong to our own nationality, and yet we belong to the kingdom of heaven. We have a political, a theological, historical side to us, narrative, and we have a, a, a spiritual, a supernatural, a sanctified one. And I'm going to try and balance those as I walk you through my journey back to the Catholic Church. One of my favourite poets, T.S. Eliot, famous for his pithy, condensed poetry, wrote, In my beginning is my end, in the second of the four quartets. As with so much of Eliot's poetry, the profundity of his insight grows during one's life. And I've discovered that it is indeed true that there are elements at the beginning of my life that match, marry, parallel the end of my life. And so I want to take you back to the years between 1980 and 1985. During these years, I, I became a smuggler. I smuggled Bibles and theological books, medicine, clothes for sale into the Soviet Union. And one of the reasons that I, I did this was to help my fellow Christians. I had read Dostoevsky, uh, which gave me a a particular view on the cogency of Christianity and faith and a certain the importance of, of 
certain moral virtues in the human quest. I had read Alexander Solzhenitsyn and had become very familiar through the reading of the Gulag Archipelago, one day in the life of Ivan Donizovich, with the terrible circumstances that the church endured and experienced in the Soviet Union. One of my journeys was to, to Prague, where I carried suitcases of theological books in for the underground Catholic Church. I knew very little about what was happening, um, but I knew more after I'd met some of the people. It was all cloak and dagger stuff. We didn't know each other's names. We met in secret locations. We uh, shook, shook off tails. I was told that whatever I did, I must do some weight training before I carried these suitcases full of books through the airport in case they looked abnormally large, not let a taxi driver carry them in case he reported me to the, the police for unusual luggage, and then engaged in handing over these books. The reason why the Catholic Church needed theological books was that the communist regime had decided that the best way of cutting off the head of the church was to make Ill ordinations illegal. There would be no more ordinations to the priesthood. And the church's response was to go underground and to, to discern vocations underground and to train priests underground. But they needed books, and that was my job. I was astonished at the courage and the bravery of some of the people I met, and uh, I, I was caught and interrogated a couple of times, both in Prague and in, and in Moscow, and these were quite unpleasant occasions. On neither occasion did I give any information. Um, and, and these are stories in themselves, but they don't really belong here. When the wall fell in 1989, I was one amongst one of the most delighted of, of, of all observers. And I was very surprised somewhere between the year 2000 and 2005 to get a sense that, that Marxism was back. It was hard to explain. This was more like a, an intuition than anything else. And I began to look and to read and to question. I was teaching at a university at the time, one of our more radical universities. Uh, and I became aware as I as I tried to give an outline to this intuitive sense that, that what I thought had died and been repulsed and uh, had been exposed uh, as a fake attempt to bring a utopia to human affairs was in some way back again. And I began to read about, uh, um, about the whole Frankfurt School and the intention to have a plan B for bringing Marxist utopianism to the West. And plan B was that if, if <clears throat> plan A failed, the proletariat failed to rise, the, the conflict between capitalism and, and the workers failed to ignite, then there would instead be a slow and steady assault on Judeo-Christian values in a culture war. And it was the, the experience of the beginning of this culture war and, and, and noticing that it was going to close down the freedom of speech that made me begin to, to think and to read and to try and understand exactly what was going on. It became clear that, that the stages of this assault on Judeo-Christian culture were going to begin with feminism uh, and then homosexuality would be the second stage with gay marriage, followed by gender dysphoria. And we think in all likelihood, um, paedophilia. Each of these categories raised questions for the church's values, for Christian values. Part of the part of the fall, as we understand it, is a fracture in relationship between men and women. And it was perhaps no accident that feminism, with its different and complex waves, has at the heart of it an aggression of femininity against masculinity, a need for, for reparation, actually for revenge, it seems. And so instead of healing one of the great fractures that, that literature and, and, and uh, human experience have wrestled with down the years, feminism, feminism sought to launch an all-out war, firstly in the name of equality and reparation, but it then began to look as though with its <clears throat> movement towards um, uh, promoting uh, masculinity as male toxicity, that equality was not at all what was after, but, but some kind of reversal of values. 
this constituted a, an assault. Each of these constitutes an assault on revelation in in feminism, particularly third wave fem feminism. We move from sex to gender. Gender is something that is a is a is a construct. Um, it's a social and cultural construct, and the priority is the imagination, the human experience, the epistemology of the existential, if you like. And yet, in 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 the scriptures, we have. God's plan as making men and women binary, men and women both in his image, with the invitation to grow into his likeness. But but men and women, there is no sliding scale of sexuality. And so one of the one of the things that feminism did in its developing project was to question uh, the primacy of this binary expression of human sexuality of men and women and particularly to undermine the idea of christian marriage as men and women coming together in love and using sex primarily for procreation sex became in the 20th century recreation not not procreation and that began a complete shift in the value system and the way in which we understood the relationship between men and women in the image of the new covenant there is a renewed healing of the relationship between men and women uh, through the, the imagery of Christ and his bride. But feminism took an entirely different route. It replaces healing and mutuality with aggression and and distinctiveness. Um, cultural Marxism looks through the lens of power, Christianity through compassion and holiness. These are two entirely different value systems. And it became clear that these progressive culture war had in its crosshairs the values of the Judeo-Christian tradition, pretending a certain kind of virtuous morality for the healing of past injustices, pretending justice, pretending equality. In fact, it sought a redistribution of power along particularly partisan lines. Gay marriage initially appears as an invitation to have compassion on people who are different. Um, most of the sociological surveys suggest that the gay population is about 1.8 to 2% of the population. And um, uh, and in, in the, the shadow of the way in which homosexuality had been treated in Christian culture, there was a great wave to validate different ways of experiencing sexual attraction as a means of, of compassion, of kindness, of social justice. But... Of course, this was dependent, first of all, upon understanding human identity through the lens of sexual attraction. One of the problems I've, I've, I've had throughout this narrative is the way in which gay Christians insist on calling themselves gay Christians when no adjective will do. We, as Galatians 3 has it, we are one in Christ, and you don't subdivide in terms of different categorizations of our humanity. And, and particularly, if you were going to categorize your humanity, of all the things you you should not choose to do, your sexual appetites shouldn't be the primary categorization of who we are. So there's something really quite wrong, some some seriously problematic dislocation between the, the agenda for gay inclusion and a Christian anthropology, the way we understand our human nature in Christ. Initially, I was profoundly sympathetic to this. I had a lot of gay friends. I'm a failed opera singer. I've I've, I've, I've lived in fairly um, liberal circles, but I began to feel that things were wrong when when the whole issue of surrogate mothers and buying children as accoutrements to offer some kind of validity to gay families arose. This was presented as a matter of human rights for the couple, but if it really was human rights, why weren't the human rights of the bought child invested in and offered some kind of comparison? Because of this emphasis on sex as gender, and because gender became a construct, we very quickly moved with with huge surprise to most of us into the realm of gender dysphoria and trans rights. It would have been beyond our imagination ten years ago to imagine that that enormously successful authors or politicians or artists would be cancelled because they wanted to 
retain a biological grasp of the difference between men and women rather than a cultural expression. They wanted to retain biology over gender. And, and yet, in an astonishing way, this priority of the personal imagination over the way we are made, the gift we are given of ourselves at birth, um, turns into a direct assault on, um, on Christian revelation and on Judeo-Christian values, as well as an assault on freedom of thought and freedom of speech, as well as an assault on, on science at the expense of social philosophy. And part of the problem with this is that the, the, the main structural values that lie behind the society that cultural Marxism progressive values are turning, attempting to overturn is, of course, a Christian one. And so Christians have to decide whether or not they can articulate a rationale for their biblical values or whether they want to um, give themselves to a, a form of social compassion, a kind of theological niceness, say, a determination to be concerned for for the vulnerable and the marginalized, which in many ways sounds like a variation of some of the concerns of, of the Old Testament prophets. But in fact, when it's done at the price of the of the epistemology of revelation, is in fact a price too high to pay. And that brings us to the, the fragility of Protestantism. It's been very interesting as an Anglican to watch the way in which particularly the evangelical community has, has been seduced by the invitation to be compassionate, to be relativistic, to be inclusive, to be kind. Um, and, and all of this, of course, made so much easier within a culture where, where the currency of sex as being restricted to a husband and a wife for the purposes of becoming co-creators with God is reduced to something recreational. It's, it's very difficult to preserve a Christian mind in the face of the onslaught through the media uh, and the way in which sex is portrayed as, as something uh, quite casual and, and unrestricted by a covenant commitment within marriage. I was very surprised to see, particularly within evan evangelical circles, which began by, by quoting the Bible and saying, well, this is what St. Paul says about sexuality. This is what the Bible says about sex. And then slowly, as the decades moved on, the pressure to be kind, to be contemporary, to be progressive, to be non-divisive, to, to fit in with, with uh, the drift of culture became so immense that within Protestantism, evangelical readings of the Bible began to change and arguments began to come. Well, you may think this verse of St. Paul's means what you say it means, but I read it completely differently. And then we found one of the, the most serious flaws of the of the Reformation, which is, I mean, of course, um, there is a great gift in that the Bible is put into the hands of, of every pilgrim, every baptized person. But the downside of that is that um, there is no agreed authoritative way of reading scripture. And the very fact that if you count the Protestant denominations, you, you vary at a conservative estimate of 200 to, a, uh, to, a, uh, to the number of 47,000, depending on how you count them. We realize the scale of the problem of Protestantism, that uh, the, the paradox is that here is a, a movement that set out to create a pure church based upon access to the church, an invisible congruity of congregations. And it ends up by being a fragmented group of 47,000 different ways of reading the Bible. There's something wrong with that. I think Protestants know that, but it's too difficult for them to uh, recognize the scale of the problem philosophically, theologically, and ecclesiologically as well. And so as this, as, as, as the church has drifted away in its understanding of marriage, of sexuality, of, of the human person, it slips all too easily into a religion that many have called um, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic because it's a, it, it, it claims to have a moral structure, moral virtues. Therapeutic because it picks up 
most of the concerns of contemporary therapy, all of which have to do with um, uh, the, the, the value of the self and the ego, the need for psychotherapeutic healing, um, the emphasis on, uh, um, on what Jung would call individuation, but, but on the whole process of non-repression. And deism, because that's the religious bit, uh, a god is in a god is posited or invented to be concerned for these morals and to underwrite this therapy. But is it Christianity? And as we look at the god of the first covenant, Yahweh, uh, and the law and the prophets, and we look at the way in which Jesus came to live out the law and the prophets amongst us, we come to look at the gift of the Holy Spirit and the whole movement for sanctity. We see that morally therapeutic deism is not Christianity, but it is. But it is the religion in, in a form of Gnostics, Gnosticism, Neo-Gnosticism that the Protestant Church has slowly but inexorably moved in the West. One of the things that an observer might see is looking at the Catholic Church's emphasis on celibacy for its religious and its priests. What looked under the shadow of Freud, who tried very hard to convince us that any curtailing of our sexual instinct leads to repression and, and illness and perhaps crime. That, that, that uh, a narrative that has fueled the use of sex as a recreational and therapeutic tool. That as we look back at this terrible twisting of uh, an understanding of sexuality, the Catholic Church's charism and concern for celibacy becomes a way of neutering this appalling Freudian perversity in the way in which it looks at sex. Certainly for most of my life, the circles I've moved in have found celibacy very difficult to justify. But now towards the end of my life, celibacy seems to me to be the most enormously important gift. It is the Catholic Church's witness to the fact that we do not have to be subject to human appetite. That sex is no more important in terms of uh, human appetite than, than, than anything else, but needs to be constrained and sanctified and offered to God and used in the right context as all our appetites need to. It doesn't get a special pass. And if it is more powerful than most of our other appetites, then perhaps it needs special treatment, which is where part of the justification for celibacy comes in. During the last half a dozen years, I found myself being invited to be a missionary bishop for the Anglican Church as, the Ang as Anglicanism split um, along the lines of the culture wars I've been describing. And although um, there was a, there is a, a large community of Anglicans in the world who would claim to want to be faithful to the Bible, one of the things I discovered was that it was almost impossible to draw to draw Protestants together uh, in a, in a renewed and um, con, con, um, I was going to say congenial, but that's not the word at all. Nor is convivial, uh, fraternal. Uh, ecclesiology and one of the reasons was there was there is no magisterium we do not possess as the catholic church does a common mind a single mind forged through time unified through the witness and the help of the holy spirit uh, and um, expressed in a catechism and this lack of magisterium, this lack of the common mind, this lack of a common vision for reading scripture meant that it was utterly impossible to draw together a, 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 an increasingly divided and schismatic church. And that was one of the reasons, the lack of magisterium, that made me look to the Catholic Church thinking, well, perhaps this is the only way to be church because any other way fails to deal with the centrifugal pressures that are present cultural struggle imposes upon upon us. One of the questions that Protestantism poses is the one that Tertullian raised in the second century. What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? 
what does our our rationality have to do with our heart? What does philosophy have to do with holiness and revelation? How do we put these two things together? And again, Protestantism seems to me to be particularly vulnerable to Athens. So in the 19th century, German higher criticism tore the confidence out of the Protestant church. A church had been born in a hunger to have access to scripture, found itself deflated and diffused by this by this intellectually sophisticated attempt in the Western positivist tradition to understand uh, the way in which the New Testament was put together, whilst having some wonderful insights in terms of, of, of literary criticism. Nonetheless, being set in a framework that was positivistic and non-supernatural, it did the most enormous damage to people's faith. Uh, again, one of the paradoxes of the Protestant settlement. So two, two of the things that caused great difficulty were German higher criticism and then the dominance of therapy and therapeutic vandal um, values. Um, and again, the Protestant church had no answer to either of these developments within our culture. This led me to begin to reread the giants of the Protestant Reformation and compare them to the early church fathers. When I came to reread Luther and Calvin in particular, as I began to try and recalibrate my understanding of the Reformation, it seems to me that both Luther and Calvin were dealing, in fact, with presuppositions that were unacknowledged and were enormously important. It's very, it's, it's um, critical at this point. I don't divert myself into a lecture on Reformation theology, but, but at the risk of being superficial, let me say that it seems to me that Luther's agenda was primarily psychological, and it was through the working out of a, of his psychological concerns that he dragged theological language along with him and, and clothed the psychological agenda in a theological apparatus which combined in a highly provocative way with with the political situation of Germany at the time and of course with the with the growing geist of the early 16th century. And as I read Calvin and, and looked at the way in which he'd constructed his own theological apparatus, it seemed to me that what I was dealing with here was actually somebody with a particular philosophical presupposition. And again, what he had done is to dress that up in a, in a, with theological language. And that neither of them were entitled to, to break the Catholic Church, as in Luther's case, he sought to renew it. And Calvin's case, he sought to challenge it. One of the things that one has to do if one reads the Reformation Fathers is to go back to the early church fathers. But at this point it had begun to occur to me that, that the way in which the Protestant church was set up was almost equivalent to somebody suffering from a long period of Alzheimer's where they had lost their early memory. The notion that one could take the scriptures and recreate church with a one and a half thousand year gap without any apostolic teaching, without anything of the chain of understanding that came down through the apostles to their successors, but simply claim a, a direct inspiration from the scriptures, scriptures that hadn't even been identified as scriptures until the Council of Carthage, when the church gave itself to the world. To prioritize scripture over the church was simply historically wrong, but lies at the as one of the first principles of Protestant self-understanding. And of course, I became quickly aware, but particularly through having read St. John Henry Newman, that it's a dangerous thing to read the, the early church fathers. One of the things that the people who have converted to Catholicism have in common is they usually start reading the church fathers at some time. And then what they see is, is they see the Catholic church in the first and second and third centuries um, of of the United Church. I became particularly enamoured with Clement 
with Ignatius, with Justin Martyr, and with Ironis of Lyon. Uh, and again, one of the things that, that impacts the Protestant as he comes to the Church Fathers looking for uh, looking for pieces in the jigsaw that will explain the development of the Church is the way in which the language is, is wholly and completely that of the Catholic Church. Where the bishop is, there let the people be, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is a Catholic Church. This is deeply refreshing when in Protestant circles the very nature of a bishop and what a, a bishop is, is one of the uh, one of the early stumbling blocks in inter-Nicene warfare between Protestants. As one looks to understand the Eucharist and what it, what it means to come across St Ignatius uh, of Antioch so early on in the Church's life, uh, uh, describing the Eucharist as the medicine of immortality, the antidote to prevent us from dying, but which causes that we should live forever in Christ Jesus. This is immediately resonant with Thomas Aquinas and with the whole narrative, the whole melody, the song of Catholic theology down the ages and utterly at odds with the obduracy and the the lack of imagination, the, the theological and philosophical boundaryness of, of, of Zwingli. Uh, in Justin Martyr we find extraordinary language used um, for, about the Eucharist from which our blood and our flesh by transmutation are nourished, it being the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. Very dangerous, very daring, very supernatural language, utterly at odds with the spirit of the Reformation. And one of course comes across the the enormous emphasis on apostolic succession. Irenaeus of Lyon writing the blessed apostles Peter and Paul having founded and built up the Church of Rome handed over the office of the Episcopate to Linus and then the long list of Linus's successors. And Cyprian of Carthage saying unambiguously if someone today does not hold fast to this unity of Peter can he imagine he still holds the faith? If he should desert the chair of Peter upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident he's in the church? And as I look back over the history of the, of the Church of England and Anglicanism, what I saw was an Erastian settlement in which politics and dynasty uh, and nationalism had taken the place of, of the Eucharist and of apostolic succession uh, and of the authority and integrity of the church. St. Augustine wrote, it is the very order of Episcopal succession to be considered how much, if the very order is to be considered, how much more do we number them from Peter himself, to whom as one representing the whole church, the Lord said, upon this rock will I build my church, Peter being succeeded by Linus, Linus by Clement, Clement by Anacletus, and he by Evaristus, and so on. The attempts within the Church of England to justify tactile apostolic succession were fragile and unconvincing but of course in the document apostolic curi which was a judgment upon the catholicity of the church of england one of the things that the pope said was well uh, let's leave aside whether or not you can prove tactile succession it looks like you can't but even if you could if we look at your ordinal and we look at your eucharistic theology you do not intend the mass and you have not intended the Mass for such a long time that you have ceased to be part of the apostolic succession. When I read that, I found myself convinced by apostolic I curi. I found that the very foundation upon which the church I had been brought up in was problematically undermined. And that brought me on my journey from Angli to Angeli to the whole issue of the supernatural. One. At this point, I hope you'll forgive me if I become very personal. 
Um, and perhaps this is the most difficult part of, of a lecture to give because it um, because it involves issues of vulnerability and judgment and, and questions about mental health. Um, I had become a good Jungian in my, my 22 years of, of lecturing in the psychology of religion at one of our more radical universities. But after a period of time, um, I, I found I had two profound experiences which stopped me in my tracks and propelled me towards the Catholic Church. One had to do with Our Lady and one had to do with the Eucharist. It, it around about 2008, um, for reasons that I, I still don't understand, I had three nights of being exposed to hell between the hours of one and five in the morning. Uh, and during these three nights, I, I got no sleep and I experienced terror and horror. Uh, I experienced particularly those two marks of the demonic, um, an insistent voice in your head saying, "This you are guilty, you deserve this. Uh, and um, another voice saying, there is no hope, only despair. After the first night of this very dreadful experience, during which I wondered if I'd lost my mind, and of course I naturally assumed I was having a nervous breakdown. I talked to a friend by the, on the phone who was a, a diocesan exorcist in the United Kingdom. And he said, this is indeed an assault from the other side and you need to pray the rosary. Nothing else will work. I was reluctant to pray the rosary, um, although I, I uh, was, was very much signed up to the, to, the, to the the Council of Ephesus that declared Our Lady Theotokos. I had resisted attempts to pray it. I'd even been told by a Greek Orthodox friend that until I had a personal relationship with Mary, I had no right to talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, on the second night, therefore, I began to pray the rosary in the face of this, this most dreadful experience. I went to bed at my normal time and was woken up uh, with a shock again at the same time, about five to one, and I prayed the rosary. And as I prayed it, I felt the force or the power of this, what seemed to me to be this dreadful demonic assault, diminish. And the third night it happened again in exactly the same way, but, but by about four in the morning, it was much reduced, much less amplified, uh, seriously diluted. And the strangest part of all this was that at this point, the room was suddenly filled with the scent of roses. The bedroom window was closed. It was early spring. There were no roses, but, but the room had an intense perfume of roses within it. And I was sufficiently well read to know that, that, that this was a sign of our, of our Lady's presence. And so I began a quest to try and discover Our Lady. And I began with, um, for reasons that I, I don't entirely remember, with Garabondal. I realise Garabondal isn't one of the official apparitions. But I, I did it because it was, it took place in the mid-60s, when I was about nine or ten. And because it would be on film. And I thought, well, this will give me a chance to, to bring to bear some level of, of observation and evaluation myself. And I was watching the children in, uh, in in film of the Garibaldal apparitions in my university office when a colleague came in. Now she was a, a research psychologist and she said, what on earth are you watching? And I, I said, well, it purports to be three children in a village in northern Spain having an apparition of Our Lady. And she looked at it very carefully and she said, well, whatever it is, treat it seriously. It's almost certainly authentic. I said, well, how can you say, look, say that looking at this so briefly? And she said, because... We've been doing some studies involving children and ecstasy. And one of the things I can tell you is you can't fake that kind of ecstasy. Those children, whatever the motivation is, they're not faking it. So as far as they're concerned, this is completely real. And so I began to look then at, at, at other apparitions and was uh, astonished to read of Our Lady by locating in AD 40 to come to the aid of the uh, James the Apostle in Zaragoza. Uh, I was astonished to see the the um, early 
apparitions uh, in Turkey, um, where uh, a, a bishop called Gregory Thaumaturges in the third century experienced Mary and the Apostle St. Apostle St. John together when he was at a particularly low point in his life and his work. I was aware of, of the various sites, particularly Walsingham in England, but I didn't know about Le puy en velay And then as I, as I came, went down through the historical apparitions and discovered this extraordinary list in Europe, um, Rue du Bac, uh, Lords, uh, of course, obviously Fatima, Garabondal, Zaitun in 1968, um, I, I realised that this wasn't something that could simply be dismissed. And I slowly but surely became convinced, um, partly from a theological reading of, uh, of the transfiguration, which I'd been taught when I was a seminarian, seconded to a Greek Orthodox monastery, uh, trying to understand the community, the communion of saints. But, but using that as a foundation, I became convinced about the possibility, the probability, the certainty of some of the apparitions. I realise, of course, that there is an enormous danger in crediting too much to the experiential and the mind and the judgment of the church needs to be brought in bear cautiously and over a fairly long period of time. But I began to pray the rosary more often and I began to find in the rosary a, uh, a stability in prayer and in spirit <clears throat> that I had never known before. Almost a power in prayer, but certainly a dimension of praying and of relating to God that was new, that was distinctive and that was potent and... Uh, I, I I wondered how I'd managed so long without it. Whatever the reasons were, I had another appalling experience of evil uh, at a place called Le puy en velay I had taken some students to Thézé. We'd had our annual retreat there. Uh, and I had gone to pray at Le puy en velay which is <clears throat> part of the journey to Santiago, to Compostela. And I was looking forward very much to attending Mass on a, in, in, an, in an ancient 8th century church dedicated to St. Michael on a, on a hill that was more like a stalactite. And as I went up there, I, I, I met the, the priest who was going to celebrate at the bottom. It's a long, steep climb. And I remember thinking what very good eyes he had. Uh, the Mass began in a very atmospheric and very beautiful church. But something dreadful happened after about five or ten minutes. I thought I'd had a stroke. I suddenly became deaf and detached from the liturgy and from what was going on. And the, the, inner, the, the inner video by which that, that continues nonetheless, what on earth? What on earth has happened? Perhaps you've had a stroke. And then suddenly above my head, it seemed to me these 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 experiences are very hard to put in, into words. It seemed to me as though there was a host of bats circling, rather like rather like mud down a plug hole, circling ab above my head and beginning to dive bomb me in a cone, a wide circle at the top and, and the, the tip of the cone being just above my head. And as these dark bat-like figures circled and, and fell down towards me, uh, they did so bringing great threat and terror and despair, so much so that I was tempted to, to shout out in fear and run out of the chapel. But I thought, I, I mustn't do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm English and at the, the, uh, one of my primary values is, is avoiding public embarrassment. I, I held on with gritted teeth, wondering what on earth was happening. What, 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 what were these things dive bombing me? With, with incarnate despair somehow. And we'd come to the point in the liturgy where, where um, the hosts were being consecrated. And part of me thought, but this is outrageous. This is a holy and ancient chapel dedicated to St. Michael of all. This ought to be a place where uh, 
where any kind of demonic disturbance should not take place why is it happening here and why in the middle of a mass and and i, I had some interesting theological questions that were beginning to peek through my panic at what point will this stop and why what will stop it and so there was the invocation of the Holy Spirit of the elements, and there was the raising of the the elevation of the elements. And at each point, I thought, surely this will drive off this this apparition of evil. And then I walked forward to receive the Eucharist, and 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 the the host was placed in my hand, and still this thing continued. And then, as I raised the host to my lips, it stopped, as if somebody had turned off a television set or a film or a light just stopped i was astonished and as i reflected on this i began to reflect on the power of the eucharist and the the problem of of the demonic i began to read some more more theology about the eucharist and i was surprised to come across the eucharistic miracle in argentina in 1992 and 1994 in Buenos Aires because what I found there was it seemed to me was a scientific answer for once science was coming to the aid of the church a scientific answer to a theological conundrum I'm sure you're aware of exactly what happened a, a host that had fallen to the ground was set aside it began to bleed um, and after some time it was sent anonymously to a laboratory in New York and the laboratory in, in New York not knowing where it came from or, or what the matter it was that was being investigated declared that it was tissue that was part of a heart muscle of the myocardium the left ventricle the muscle that gives life to the to the whole body the the tissue revealed that it belonged to a person who had gone through intense pain experiencing extended periods unable to breathe and had immense strain put on the heart common feature of crucifixion there was evidence from the intact white blood cells being found in the tissue that this was so um, i'm told that the scientist who was a jewish atheist who conducted the studies has become a catholic after discovering where the tissue came from but there were a number of now that the science was available there were a number of other eucharistic miracles where the same tests were made one in in the parishes of martin of tours in tixla in mexico in 2006 another one in poland in 2008 the parish of saint anthony of sokolka and so i began to be more and more convinced that it was absolutely essential that whatever mass i was part of was an authentic mass of the catholic church and i looked around i saw no eucharistic miracles in protestantism <clears throat> i saw none in anglicanism and i began to say to myself that the agnosticism i had had about about my anglican orders was no longer bearable or tenable for a very long time i had longed to be part of the same church of, as many of my heroes obviously the early church fathers that i've mentioned already but particularly saint augustine <clears throat> whose confessions i've been reading for a very long time uh, of some of my heroes like anselm and thomas Becket and thomas more obviously of saint john henry newman whose apologia i had been carried around in my first years after ordination and slowly but surely i had i had come to the conviction that i needed to be part of that church i had also come to the conclusion that in terms of the culture wars and the dreadful assault on freedom of thought and freedom of speech only the catholic church with its faithfulness to the magisterium would have the capacity and the strength to stand up and withhold and see off this great assault on civilization none of the other churches perhaps with the exception of of the eastern orthodox church which is a, i would say is a branch of the catholic church depending on how one understands the schism of 1054 but for the moment let's put that in brackets none of the other churches it seems to me had the capacity to deal with the crisis that's coming upon our culture as it struggles for its integrity and as it has to choose essentially between marx and jesus <clears throat> 
and I wanted to be in communion with Augustine and Thomas More and Sir John Henry Newman. And so when my local diocesan bishop said to me, We know you're a Catholic. When are you going to convert? And I said to him, Well, at the right time, certainly before my deathbed, I won't leave it as long as Constantine. And uh, his response was, I think you should do it now, straight away. And as I thought, I, mean, I didn't, this was an unexpected conversation, but as I, I thought and I prayed on the instant, I had a very deep sense that to say no to my bishop would be to say, to say no to our Lord. And the only possible answer was yes. I found him being received into the Catholic Church a joy that is really hard to express. I cannot tell you what delight it gave me to be in communion with St. Augustine, in particular. Uh, I could make up some reasons for this, but 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 it's it was simply the fact. I was at home in the church that Jesus founded, guarded by apostolic succession, free to talk, to love uh, Our Lady, free to pray the rosary, free to invoke the communion of saints free to receive Mass without any shadow of doubt or of dispute, uh, beyond schism, finally. I had come from the Church of the Angles to the Church of the Angels, non Angli, Sid Angeli, and have been profoundly and wonderfully grateful for it. And so that brings us to this particular point in the story. I'm very sorry I'm not with you, and can't answer questions directly. But thank you for listening, thank you for your understanding, and thank you for your prayers.